Hello and welcome back to Pakistan Explorer. I hope you guys are doing great. Today we are back with a bit of an eccentric topic. This relates to the, the accounts of so many renowned climbers and uh, adventurers and, and who have been climbing the high mountains in Nepal and Pakistan and also in South America. And these accounts refer to the, the, the supernatural phenomena that they have experienced in high mountains. Uh, renowned personalities like uh, of Reynable Messner, Eric Shipton, Douglas Heston, Doug Scott, um, Frederick Smith, uh, so many people who have, uh, who have uh, quite a bit of a portfolio in the adventure world. Um, so we are going to, to go through some of these accounts which are very intriguing and more chilling experiences that were narrated by the, these climbers in their books and interviews and the story of Vanda Rukwizic, the first Polish woman and actually the first woman uh, to climb K2 back in 1986. She was uh, with uh, several of the climbers who were part of the, the, this expedition back in 1986, which was later known as the Black Summer because of the accident on K2, which claimed 13 climbers. And uh, she was able to uh, come down successfully from K2 and then she went on to climb several eight thousand years. Eventually she died in Kanchenjunga in 1992. And uh, the, the story is narrated by uh, Jennifer Jordan's book, The Savage Summit. And um, she has also given accounts of the first-hand stories of the events and ex uh, uh, that these climbers, some of these climbers have experienced on, on high mountains. And one of Vanda's friend, Eva Marzabriska, Eva got this call in the middle of the night uh, after a couple of years after Vanda had disappeared on Kanchanjunga, where he was never found or recovered. And it was Vanda on the other side, and, and Eva was naturally delighted to hear the voice of her friend on the other side, and she said, We are all in despair. Where are you? And the voice responded, I'm cold. I'm very cold. And don't cry everything will be fine. And Eva went on to ask her, but why aren't you coming back? And the, and the voice of Vanda on the other side said, I cannot, before the poem went dead. Similarly, the story of the British climber Julie Tullis, the third woman to climb K2. Um, she, is, uh, she was a British, British climber. She was uh, part of the expedition with Kurt Bienberger and Trouble of the Climbers. It was the same expedition, the same summers, which experienced this uh, uh, slip of the Serac uh, uh, above the bottleneck on K2, which claimed 13 deaths. A bit curt, and she had a big fall. And um, the fall was so bad, she was already uh, hypothermic and she was already frostbitten, and she was also uh, snow blinded. Uh, near the bottleneck. And with this fall, she eventually lost it all and she decided to stay at Camp 4 and she could not move an inch. And obviously the, the situation was so bad back then that all the other climbers were deciding uh, to descend regardless of who to abandon, who to uh, rescue on the high mountain. Everybody was trying to save their own life. So Julie was left behind on Camp 4 with several other climbers which later died and uh, their bodies were never found. Obviously, they got buried in tons of snow and went missing. Years later, in 1992, uh, there was a Russian-American expedition. Uh, two climbers, uh, Thor Kaiser and Scott Fisher, um, they were stationed at the base camp on K2. Uh, there were a couple of other expeditions as well, uh, all of them stationed in K2 because of the inclement weather. So the last one officer had all the head counts. Uh, everybody was stationed at the base, base camp. Nobody was on the mountain. And in the middle of the night, Kaiser and Fisher were in the in the Congo, and a couple of other campers were there. And the radio cranked, and the voice said, "Cab four to base camp. Do you read over?" There was a bit of a silence uh, for some moments in the Congo because everybody knew that there's nobody on top of the mountain. And there were a couple of climbers present at that time who could actually recognize the voice of Julie Tubbis. 
Everest obviously has the biggest share of um, tragedies, obviously because so many people have been on top of uh, Everest. More than 10,000 people have been able to climb Everest. Um, hundreds of people have died in the process. Hundreds of bodies and corpses are still um, lined on, the, on top of the mountain. On the northeast face of Everest, there is a valley which is famously known as the Rainbow Valley. And if somebody be able to reach that spot, you will realize that this name is spot on because the valley is scattered with colorful clothing and uh, down suits of all the dead climbers scattered all over the place. And there are so many bodies and corpses lying in, in this rainbow valley that you realize the gravity and the, the eeriness of the place that uh, so many climbers have lost their lives and the bodies are still over there. So it's like a big graveyard, this Rainbow Valley. And um, all in, in the Hindu mythology, in the, in the Buddhist mythology as well, they believe that the gods reside on top of the mountain. This is the reason why they offer their prayers before, before the start of the expedition, asking for the mercy of the gods to allow them to, allow them to rise on top of the, the, uh, the mountain that they intend to climb. And uh, uh, the story of green boots is obviously uh, very intriguing because this is a body which has been lying right in the passage of the, the climbers, the trail that climbers normally take to go to the, the Henry Step. And this is the body of uh, an Indian climber uh, whose name was Sivang Peljur, um, who was coming down from the summit of the Everest, but he was so exhausted and so badly frostbitten and so blinded that he refused to go down any further. He died in that spot. His body is now being referred to as landmark, the, uh, the, the passage towards the top of the Everest. Uh, there was another climber, a uh, British climber, David Chart, um, who actually was also snow blinded on as a bad shape, and he decided to sit with the green boots in the small cave, and he also died in that place. Later, the the, the, the family of the the climber, the green boots, decided to remove his body and to bury him in a in a more respectable place and away from the ice and everything. So there are so many bodies on top of Everest that the climb was actually come across on um, so many skeletons, so many frozen skeletons. Similarly, the story of uh, Rainbow Master is very intriguing as well. He has been on top of Everest several times. In 1978, he was able to reach the top of Everest with Peter Habler without the use of supplemental oxygen. Uh, it was a groundbreaking uh, event uh, in the, the medical world as well. And he has uh, referred to this third man factor several times. He has experienced the presence of this third man uh, on most of his solo ascents uh, on top of high mountains. And sometimes he, uh, he says that these presents were benign and sometimes he was freaked out with this uh, third man factor. But more, more interestingly, uh, his accounts of the Bigfoot or the, the Yeti or the Snowman uh, is very, very interesting because he spent quite a lot of time uh, trying to explore and investigate the presence of this uh, this snowman. And uh, he he says that I have seen the, the uh, foot, uh, footprints of this snowman so many times. Uh, I have uh, felt the presence, I've seen the silhouettes of these um, JTs in the high mountain so many times and I believe that it actually exists and he but he still believes that uh, this mythical creature is actually uh, present in the high mountain. Uh, Eric Shipton, uh, an amazing um, explorer of the Arctic and uh, uh, an accomplished adventurer, he came up with this uh, footprint of the, the Bigfoot in Ever uh, while he was climbing Everest. So much so that he even uh, went off the beaten track uh, trying to locate the, the presence of uh, this uh, this creature which left the footprint. They went for several miles off the beaten track and eventually decided to come back because they did not find anything. Um, in 1975, uh, Dougal Heston and Doug Scott, uh, very famous names, big climbers, big wall climbers, the climbers of Ogre for the first time. Uh, they were climbing Everest uh, uh, through a new route 
and uh, they got stuck somewhere at the high camps and uh, they had to be back and spend night in a snow cave and they believed that there was a presence of a third person along with them throughout the night and they kept chatting with them they uh, cracked jokes with them they laughed and they shared meals with that third person and uh, they say that that third person actually helped them um, survive the night and they eventually came down Last but not least, the story of Elizabeth Rivol, a very recent one, when she was stranded in Nanga Parbat in 2018. Um, she had uh, left Tomak Moskowicz in high camp near Cap 4, and she was descending to get help because Tomak was so blinded, he was throwing up blood, and uh, he was really in a bad shape. And the Pakistani authorities were in the process of uh, uh, retrieving the two rescue climbers uh, from the Kitu base camp, Adam Biliski and then Shuruko, and to get them to the Narabarba base camp, the Amir phase. Uh, but obviously, the weather was really bad, and the heli flights were uh, stranded at that time. And uh, while Elizabeth was descending, she had to spend two nights and, in snow caves and crevasses uh, to survive the, the uh, frightening blizzards on top of Narabarba. Uh, on the first night, she uh, descended down the crevice to uh, to avoid the, the raging blizzards and the wind chill. Um, then in the morning, she went out of the crevice and started descending again, but um, the rescue team was not there as yet. So another night, she had to spend again in a crevice. By this time, she was also hallucinating. She was also badly frostbitten uh, and possibly she was uh, suffering from cerebral edema because she was not using uh, supplemental oxygen. It was an alpine style time. And she says that while I was sleeping, I was half asleep and I felt the presence of an old lady and inside the crevice. And this old lady came up to her and she offered her a cup of tea, a warm cup of tea. And she asked her to give one of her climbing books uh, in return of the warm cup of tea, which Elizabeth uh, readily agreed to. She gave, uh, took off her climbing boot, one of her climbing boot, and uh, gave it to the, the old lady uh, in return for the warm cup of tea. And she descended without one uh, boot, climbing boot, and she was secured later on from the top of the Kinshofer wall, and she survived. Well, sadly, Tom was not able to survive. But the presence of this old lady has also been mentioned by Ray Double Master during uh, his uh, uh, travels of Nanga Barba. When he was uh, climbing with his brother Gunther Messner, they uh, started climbing from Rupal's side and they descended from the Diabir phase. I think it was back in the 70s, late 70s somewhere. And a lot of controversy was rolled out against this, uh, uh, against Reynold Messner for uh, compromising the, the life of his brother and everything. But Messner has also mentioned the presence of this old lady on top of mountains, same as on Nanga Parbat especially. And he says that this old lady has been spotted by him a couple of times. He's been on, on Nanga Parbat several times. This is his favorite place, spends his summers over there. From this, uh, from the medical standpoint, uh, the, the doctors believe that this is uh, the malfunction of the brain when the time will cross at the death early, the 8,000 meter zone, where the oxygen is so less uh, that the brain starts to malfunction, gives you the, the impression that you're in the presence of somebody else. But so many events, so many experiences by so many renowned climbers for so many decades, definitely. Uh, could not just be written off like that. Hope you like the vlog. Uh, we'll catch you later. You take care of yourself. Thanks.